Hey there, Python trainer Ruben Lerner here. And today I want to talk to you about object-oriented programming in Python. And this topic comes from the courses that I teach around the world at companies. It all comes from my video courses. And I'm constantly getting feedback and questions from people who don't have experience with objects. And they sort of are confused by a bunch of things. They're confused about why do we need objects? What is their goal? And what is all this weird terminology that people in the object-oriented world use as opposed to people in the non-object world? And it's actually way, way simpler than you might think. Um, but it's dressed up in some combination of, yes, jargon and terminology, and also I'd say some like religious fervor that people have about objects. Um, so what I want to do is show you how we would implement something very simple without objects, how we would implement the same thing with objects, and how we can sort of translate between the two and think about them. So let's start off by assuming that I want to keep track of people in my system. That's a pretty common thing, right? It might be students, it might be um, you know, teachers, it might be employees, it might be citizens of a country, all sorts of possibilities. So how would I keep track of that? Well, I would typically in Python use a tuple for that. So what I can do is I can say person equals, I'm going to assign this to a variable, and I'm going to, here's my tuple. I'm going to create my tuple. It's going to be, let's, let's have a person that I know well myself. So I'm going to have here Reuven and Lerner, and we'll say here that uh, you know, 51, which is my age, and 46, which is my shoe size. Okay, so far so good. And somewhere we're going to document that each person tuple contains, we're going to say here, zero is going to be first name, and one is going to be last name, and two is going to be age, and three is going to be shoe size. Um, by the way, obviously putting age in a database like this is a bad idea. You would actually want to put in the date of birth and then calculate it. Let's ignore that for now. And so then how can I get information out of this? Well, I could just retrieve it. I could say like person zero and person one, but very often I'm going to want to create some functions. So I could say here like def get first name p. We'll say return p of zero and def get last name of p and return p of one. And then def get uh, age of p is going to be return p of two. And then def get shoe size of p and we'll say return p of three. I can even say def get full name of p and we'll say return and we'll do an f string here of p of zero and p of one. And so now what I can do is I can say get full name of this person. Oops, sorry, what did I forget here? Uh, what? I, oh, haha, there we go. Got it. Got the curly braces working right there. There we go. I get the full name and say get shoe size of p uh, person, and we'll get that. And this all seems to work just fine. So in a real program, I would have my data, right? And I would have my functions, and they're sort of not directly connected. Yes, I have my data defined in such a way that the functions know what to do. But the data is sort of over here on one side, and the functions are here on the other side. And I, as the programmer, need to sort of keep track of what's going on. What happens if I want to add a new field to my person, right? Then let's say I want to add a country to that. So I'll say here, Israel, which is where I live, right? Then I have to define that new field there. I'd have to sort of update my documentation. Let's like copy my documentation here because it's so good. I mean, no one reads documentation, so it doesn't really matter. I'll say four is going to be country. And then here at the bottom, I could add like a, you know, def get country of P, return P of four. And all this will work just fine, right? And people do write code like this. There's plenty of non-object-oriented code in the world. Think of the C language, right? C is not an object-oriented language. And so you have data and you have functions and people do actually somehow survive using C although perhaps not with their sanity intact. Regardless, this does work, but you can start to already see the problems that are cropping up. Problem number one is I've got the data in one place and the functions that work on that data in another place, and there's no obvious connection between them. The second thing is what I just did now, where I added a new field to my tuple. I had to update the documentation and update the functions to accommodate it. And that's in like a simple case. What if I have something more complicated where it could be worse? 
But there's a third problem and a deeper problem here. And the deeper problem is that I'm not really thinking at a very high level of abstraction. I'm thinking here in terms of the tuple, in terms of strings, in terms of functions. And I want to think at like a higher level. I want to just be able to think of a person object. Now that might seem weird. Like why does it matter whether I'm thinking of a tuple or thinking of a person? Well, abstraction is one of the most important, powerful ideas in computer science, in engineering in general. Right, and the analogy that I always use is if you're driving your car, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of processes happening in your car as you drive it. But if you thought about all those processes, you'd never be able to keep track of it, you'd never be able to drive. So what you do is you think of your car as a one thing instead of many, many things. And you think of it at a higher level. So when you press on the accelerator to go faster, you're not thinking about all the different things that are going on in order to make you go faster. You're just pressing on the accelerator and you go faster, or you press on the brake and you go slower. That is the advantage of abstraction. And you can take it even further where if you're thinking of the car as your base unit and not all the things happening inside of it, then you can think of a traffic jam. You can think of a parking lot, something that is built up out of many cars. And so here, think of my person as a tuple. I could have like a list of tuples. We do that in Python all the time. But I wouldn't be thinking in the same sort of way as I do of a bunch of people, right? So that thinking, does it, does it mean that you can't do it? No but it makes it harder to think about it, to reason about it. Just as you can do all of your calculations in Roman numerals, but you'll probably want to use decimal numbers because it's easier to accomplish a whole lot of things. The same is true with having a higher level of abstraction. So that's a lot, that's a lot of the motivation behind using objects. Well, how would I take then this one person tuple and turn it into a person object that I would use? Well, here's the thing. I'm not going to want to create just one person. I'm going to want to create many person objects, many people. And so I'm going to create a new class, a new type of data that can create any person I might like. And we call that new type a class. A class is basically a category of object that are all going to have the same fields but different values. So every person object will have a first name, a last name, an age, a shoe size, and a country. That's okay. I'm going to now describe how all of my people should look, what sort of features they should have, what sort of fields they should have, and then I can create any number of people matching us. So the way we do this in Python is we say class person, and notice that person here is a capital P at the beginning. That's because classes traditionally in Python have a capital letter at the beginning. They don't have to, but it's a traditional conventional thing to do. And then I'm going to say here def dunder init of self, and I'm going to say here first and last. I'm just not going to put in all the rest of the fields because it's not worth it, but I could. And then I would say here self.first equals first, and self.last equals last. And then I can say here, p equals person of Ruben and learner. And then I can say print p dot first, and we get Ruben. Print p dot last, we get learner. So what's going on here? This is a lot of, again, stuff that seems sort of magical and weird, but it's not that weird when you sort of think about what's going on. Remember that a class, so a class defines a new type of data in Python. Now, this new type of data, of course, is built up of existing pieces of data. So yes, you can build a bridge, but the, and the bridge is made up of metal beams or of wooden slats, but you want to think about it as a bridge at a higher level. So here, my person has two strings, first name and last name, but I'm going to think about it at a higher level. All right, and so I can create, I, you know, after defining this, I can create any person by calling the class, by invoking the class with parentheses. So here I call the person class and get back a new object of type person, right? And along the way, I pass two arguments, Ruben and learner, which will be assigned to the fields first and last. And after I've done that, I can retrieve the field first with p.first. And sure enough, I get it back. I can retrieve the field last with p.last. Now, fields in Python are actually, that's the term used in many other languages. Also, the term is often an instance variable, right? Which means that it belongs to one individual object. So right here, the first name for this person object is Reuven. But the first name for another person object would be something else, presumably, because my name is kind of unusual. I have to keep it that way. But what's going on here? What is this dunder init that I've created? So first of all, it's called dunder init, which means double underscore init, 
right? Or double underscore before and after the word in it. That's sort of Python jargon. This is not a normal thing in every language. It's just a normal thing in Python. And what this method does is, right, this method is invoked immediately after a new person object is created, but before it is returned to the user. Well, there's a lot of jargon in there too, so let's pick that apart. This method, what do I mean by a method? So methods are functions defined inside of a class. That's basically it. There's a little more to it than that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But methods are functions defined inside of a class. So when we talk here about functions, yeah, those are functions, those are verbs that I'm creating, and they can be called anywhere with anything. They don't have any dot before their name because they don't belong to any class, they don't belong to any object. By contrast, methods all do belong to a class, they belong to an object, they can invoke on it, and dunder in it is a special one, and we can see that because it has that dunder, right? Any method or any dunder method in Python is special, special, right? We normally don't invoke it ourselves, but we let Python call it on our behalf at particular points in time. So what's the point in time that dunder init is invoked? Right after the new object has been created. So when I say p equals person Ruben learner, Python goes off, creates a new instance of person using a new method, which we don't touch, we're not going to talk about. And then just before it returns that new method, uh, I'm sorry, just before it returns that new person object, Python says, wait, 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 maybe there's a dunder in it that I should be calling. And there it is. And the role of dunder in it is to add attributes, to add new fields to our new object. So the role of dunder in it is to create, is to add new attributes, right, after a dot, to the newly created object. Yeah, well, where is that newly created object? How can I address it? How can I add new fields to it? Good news, self, the first parameter, right, the first parameter for any method is called self. And no, you don't have to call it self. Yes, you should call it self. Obviously, you're not going to call it a ridiculous name like this, which no self-respecting programming language would use. And self is a local variable, and it's a parameter, and it represents, it has a reference to the newly created object. It's like a baby object, a naked object. And we are going to clothe it, right, to extend that metaphor a little too far. So any assign, any attribute we assign to self will be added to the new object. So basically we assign to a new attribute called first, the first name, the first name that we got from the caller. Right here I called person with two arguments, Ruben and Learner. Those are passed off to Dunder in it. And then we assign them to our attributes here. So when the, when the method is done, it's done adding new attributes. Then Python finally returns the new object. You don't have to return from dunder init because it doesn't have any role other than adding attributes. And then p has these two attributes, first and last. And in fact, I can see them by saying vars of p. And there we go. We see first is Ruben and last is learner. And now I can create as many new person objects as I want. I say p2 equals a person of, I don't know, you know, Mary Smith. Right? And now I say vars of p2. And p2 will have exactly the same attribute names, first and last but we'll have a different set of values, we can hope. So how is this better than creating our tuple here? We can think of this higher level, and now I can create a whole bunch of person objects, and I think of them as person objects. I can also retrieve the first and last name and not think about tuple indexes, zero and one, and so on and so forth. And I can add new functionality within the class. So I can say here, for example, def full name of self. Self is once again the object we're working on, and I can say here return uh, self dot first space self dot last, right? And so we have all these things, and now I can say here, watch this. I can say p dot full name, and I call the method. I invoke the method, and I get back Ruben Learner p two dot full name, and I get that back. And so it's this higher level of thinking that's the real reason we want to use objects. But at the end of the day, object-oriented programming is an organizational technique. It's a management technique. And I don't mean management in charge of you as a programmer. It's a way of managing our code so we can think about it at a higher level and then use it in better ways. So at the end of the day, objects are just data, but they are data that have access to methods, which are functions. And so instead of, let's watch this, if I say here S equals A, B, C, D, E. So I can say len of S. Here I'm calling a function on S. 
But if I say s.upper, here I'm calling a method on s. Both are verbs, both do things, both return values, but upper is a method and it's tightly connected to our string is a string method, whereas len can be called a whole bunch of different things. All right, I hope that this helped to clarify a whole bunch of the jargon, terminology, ideas behind object-oriented programming in Python. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them here, or you can always contact me on Twitter. And I once again remind you that I have a free weekly newsletter. It goes out now to about 25,000 people called Better Developers. Sign up and get a new article about Python every single week. And I look forward to seeing you here again. I'll be back very soon with more videos about Python.